So I'm just hitting the record button. So the session is being recorded. So thank you. Right. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, my name is Olatunle Jiroju, um, and we welcome you to today's um, event. I'm um, looking at the topic on researching um, on anti-racism you know, the people and, and the purpose be behind that. And today we've got a fantastic um, panel, um, three powerhouses um, in this space, and we're really, really lucky to have them um, talk to um, us about this very important topic today. Um, so uh, first we've got um, uh, Tirumani um, Nadan, um, who is consultant in um, H and also the chair of the um, ALT um, SIG. Um, by way of profile, um, Tirumani works mainly around internationalization, um, inclusive and digital um, education. Um, she approaches you know, higher education challenges based on her own um, higher education scholar experience in different countries, and of course, um, our collaborations with different institutions across the globe. Uh, she's been working around, of course, DEI um, since her student years um, in the UK, um, and she founded the Women in Academia Network at her um, alma mater, which is the University of Reading. And um, she be, she's been advocating for changes um, for female students and staff. You know, she's also worked um, with students with disability, bringing simple solutions to you know, to allow them to continue um, and um, and complete their study of choice. So she's currently, like I said, the chair of the um, anti-racism and learning technology special interest group within the um, ALT, and, and she's also an advocate for, for digital um, equity. So thank you very much, uh, Tirumani, for joining us um, this afternoon. Um, and then we also have um, Emanuela uh, Giray, um, she is a reader in management at um, Liverpool Business School um, at um, Liverpool John Moores University. Um, she's a colleague. Um, her research agenda lies at the intersection of management, um, organisational studies and development studies, um, particularly on you know, whether and how management theory and practice can contribute to making um, organizations and institutions and societies uh, more just, more equitable and more sustainable. Um, and of course, within this agenda, uh, one of our very key research interests is decolonizing management knowledge and research. Uh, our th third speaker uh, today is um, Iwi Ugyagbe uh, Green. Um, uh, Iwi's got over 20 years experience of working in higher education and nearly 15 years experience of supporting students in, in HE. Uh, she's a reader at uh, Manchester Metropolitan University Business School and she's also a lapsed um, accountant. She describes herself as, as an academic um, activist and anti-racism scholar. Um, in the last five years, her work as focused on race and the and its intersection uh, with other characteristics within the context of um, student education, um, experience, transition, and progression to um, graduate labor market, and of course to postgraduate study as well. Um, and Iwi is recognized nationally uh, as an expert on race equity issues that impact students in higher education and also in the space of graduate employment. So thank you very much um, uh, to our three panelists for um, honoring our invitation today. So we're looking forward to um, talking about all things anti-racism, especially around anti-racism um, research. So um, again, I would also like to thank everyone for um, coming to today's session. I'm, I hope you know to be a very productive um, one for us. So what I'll do now is I'll stop sharing so that we can see each other, uh, so we can see the presenters um, very well. So I'll just stop sharing. Bear with me one, with me one second. Okay, now we can see each other. Um, so thank you again for coming. Um, so without further ado, can we just jump straight into 
the questions for the day. Now, just to give you a, a quick background, also sort of housekeeping rules as well, is if you've got any questions or any comments uh, with regards to what is being discussed, then please pop them into the chat section. Um, once we finish with the um, set of questions that we've got for the panelists, we will invite everybody else to um, ask whatever questions that they might have. So if you've got any questions, please pop them into the chat section and either myself or my colleague um, Roshni um, will sort of um, voice them out so that everyone can, can hear. So thank you very much again for coming. So um, the first question um, really is around, you know, your, your DEI research journey. All right, so if I can um, ask, you know, how did you, happen into um, DEI research or, or how did you start your journey into um, research around diversity, um, equity and, um, and inclusion? So if I come to uh, Tirumani first um, and then we can come to Manuel after and, and, and then Iwi. Thank you. Okay, so where do I start with DEI, right? There's so many of it you've already mentioned um, a bit in the intro. So I think it started about um, 17 or 18 years ago when I became a PhD student. So pretty much the very first month. And I'll tell you why, because it was a mix of discrimination, a mix of serendipity as well. And well, I stumbled uh, upon some because I, I didn't get the support that I needed. So I'll start with the disability work because that's the one that I started uh, first thing in the UK. And um, so as a PhD student, I actually secured a scholarship. And interestingly enough, my scholarship, me along with two other uh, POC girls, we were not awarded the scholarship amount that we were supposed to get. And uh, interestingly with me, that dragged on until the end of my PhD. So somehow I needed to get a job and that's how I started to work with the disability office as a student at that time with them. And um, we had, it was, it was something, it was an experience that kind of stayed with me. Like, I think it will stay with me forever. We had our first blind student in the system engineering department at that time. And interestingly, loads of lecturers at that time were telling her, were trying to pressure her into changing program. And so there was me and along with some lab, te lab technicians, we were just kind of working around how do you teach engineering maths and circuit boards to someone who's born blind and it was very interesting i did learn some braille uh, a bit of maths equation at that time but which i've forgotten and interestingly and more kind of the complete opposite polar was at that time i was doing my phd on augmented reality and virtual reality in a cave so not just the handset but in a full full room it was very interesting because well blind students can use that and i started to question myself a lot on inclusivity then and yeah it started around that and the other angle so you mentioned earlier that i did found the uh, women in academia network that was also when i was a phd student i happened to so the, there was something called the uk resource center for women in set so i started to volunteer with them and uh, we were working on projects for girls in STEM, for getting women back into the STEM workforce once they've had a career break. And that's how it started. And one day somebody told me, oh, you know, there's no woman network. So that was 17 years ago. Um, and I was like, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> I'll set it up. And that's how I started to get into more DI. It was like from disability to women empowerment. And then, uh, interesting, it was it was an interesting journey because I was also discriminated for having done that. And then, as at that time I was already I was obviously an international student, so I already had had experience in five different countries before. So internationalization and TNE was already something very uh, close to me. And I happened to be invited to participate in a focus group for international students. And it was just really alarming that the person, while it was a British born, who didn't quite understand the challenges of international students in the UK. And then I decided, OK, if the person who's being paid and then is a role who is supposed to help me, cannot help me, then I'll get I'll, I'll do it myself. That's how I started to do it, because I was already active 
uh, at the EU level and immigration and stuff like this at the EU level, but not in the UK. So then I was like, I'll do it in the UK as well. And then uh, the rest, I think, is a bit of history. And now I'm the chair of anti-racism and learning uh, tech SIG. So it's been different things at different times, but mostly it started in when I started like the first month of my PhD. <laughs> I don't know if that answers your question, but that's been a bit of my journey. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, yeah, I completely understand. We, we're really interested in understanding, you know, how people start, you know, their journey in, you know, research and around anti-racism because it can be quite daunting, especially, you know, for somebody who's sort of new to the field. And it's always very helpful to see how, you know, others actually started their journey within um, within this space. So thank you very much for sharing for sharing that. Um, so if I'm then uh, move on to Emanuela, Emanuela. Thank you, Tunde. Thanks a lot. Um, I started working on um, DI issues uh, when I finished my master. And uh, I was living in Italy, in Sardinia more exactly, which is um, the region where I come from. And when I finished my master, I set up with uh, a few uh, female colleagues and no-profit organizations. Organization, and we were mainly working on gender issues in Italy. Uh, in terms of um, supporting women to return to work after unemployment or after maternity. And we were involved in different projects um, linked, to the Europe linked to European projects regarding women emancipation and empowerment. Um, then I moved in the UK, to the UK in 2004. And I started working with an organization which was called uh, Race Equality Network. And the organization's aim was that of uh, supporting organizations in the social housing sector uh, to um, uh, deal with inequality within the organization. So my role within this organization was that of setting up the training function and support consultancies. So I did work with many social housing organizations, supporting them through training or supporting them in developing their strategies, their, their policies. And it was an enlightening experience for me because the social housing sector is very diverse and I had the opportunity to work with, maybe it is very diverse, maybe not in terms of social class, but it's very diverse for many other different axes of identity. And I had the opportunity to work with tenants association, with board members, with uh, suppliers. So I was exposed to many different realities uh, and working on EDI issues different from gender, disability, race. And in this period, I also started working, uh, um, as, working as more as an activist with uh, asylum seekers in the UK and I supported the constitution of a, um, an organization that is called WAST in Manchester, which stands for Women Asylum Seeker Together. So I was working with, H, with Race Equality Network, which then changed the name to Housing Diversity Network, and then uh, working as an activist, yeah, with, uh, especially with, with asylum seekers organizations. After this period in 2007, I um, decided to volunteer for two years with Volunteering Service Overseas. I don't know if you know about this charity, it's an international charity that places volunteers from uh, the global north to the global south. So they base matching skills needed by specific organization in different countries in the global south with uh, volunteers in the global north. So I went to volunteer for two years in Uganda, working as management advisor, organization development advisor with small NGOs in Uganda. And that was, again, another very enlightening experience because I arrived there with the hope, like many volunteers, I assume, to be helpful, to uh, put my expertise and my experience at the service of uh, this small NGOs working in rural areas. But I realized soon that my knowledge and expertise were not so helpful. 
and that I really had to reinvent and to learn a lot about what uh, being a management advisor meant, what kind of how and how I could support these organizations. So that was a key experience in terms of my engagement with decolonizing uh, management knowledge and research because I really I realized from my lived experience that what I knew about management and what I knew about organizations did not apply in the context where I was working, was not helping those organizations that I was working with. So this led to an engagement with decolonization and inevitably also with issues around whiteness because I found myself as often as the only white person working in a very rural context with um, the expert label upon me, the advisor label. So obviously this, this coupled with the colonization uh, um, interest that was rising, uh, that I was starting to um, engage with, plus my positionality in the field, this led them to start engaging more deeply with issues around anti-racism, whiteness, racism, coloniality, colonialism, and what this all means in the field of uh, management studies. Because while I was doing, the, my, during my period in Uganda, I also decided to do a PhD um, on these issues. So this, what started as a personal engagement became also more an intellectual and theoretical engagement around these issues. I don't know if I have replied, answered your question. Ex no, excellent. Yeah, you, you've answered it. Thank you very much. Quite a journey uh, both of you have had in, you know, into this into this space. So thank you for, for sharing that. Um, I think we're still having difficulty in getting the third um, panelist in. Um, we're, we're trying to sort that out, so hopefully um, we will be able to join us um, very soon. Um, but let's move on to the next um, question. So thank you very much for um, um, those um, uh, for sharing those um, journeys with, with us. So next question then is around, you know, okay, you've happened into this space, you know, you started your, your journey in here. Are, are there any sort of specific challenges um, that you faced, you know, um, when you started out? In this journey, or, or are there any challenges that you currently face um, in your research into um, a DEI? This could be at maybe in institutional challenges or even at a personal level. Um, are there any challenges? Um, Tirumani, should I come to you first? Okay, thanks a lot, Tunde. So definitely there are challenges. I think in any research you do at institutional level or when you're trying to do something new, you will have challenges. And in DEI particularly, well, in the UK, you do have challenges. I'll break it into three, if that's all right with you. So at a research level, DEI is in itself challenging, okay? So you stay, you're challenging the status quo, the de facto, uh, so de facto there'll be challenges. And for example, many times I've been questioned by people, it's not because they are coming from maybe an inquisitive point of view, but they are just simply unaware. They are maybe not well enough read or have not been exposed entirely. So even for example, on the topic of anti-racism, there's always this challenge that you have people who just not necessarily have that experience with it, but then they do uh, create challenges within the research. And, um, there's also interestingly, like in the educational sector, you know, I, I wouldn't say that education, for example, like even if you take anti-racism, because our media is so biased. So there are people who have been framed to understand uh, to understand racism and anti-racism in a specific way because they are not reading all the literature that's there. And not everyone, I would say, is open to a healthy debate. And it's like it's slightly difficult also even in terms of collaborators. So either you stick with your little group of people, like, for example, us who are present today in this chat and, and we collaborate on the research, which then kind of defies the whole purpose of DEI and getting it out there and getting people to really understand what you're trying to do and what is challenging the status quo and different perspectives about. 
or you do the alternative, which is, yeah, you invite everyone, but then you have to firefight all the time. So that's one, <laughs> one major challenge that I face. It's more like mindset of people. So you can have people who are less knowledgeable or less passionate than you, or even in the skill set or not willing to even be open to, you know, learning more. So you have, you have that. And, uh, I, I wrote a blog about navigating racism or pseudo anti racist. That's from my personal experience, but at a personal level, I mean, I've had, <laughs> I've had, uh, contracts, uh, you know, not being renewed, long edge talk cases, all these things. You have to go through that. When you do DEI, you go through all of that because a lot of people who do DEI are doing it because of leave experiences as well. So, and one other thing I would say is when you're trying to create uh, impact is someone else higher up sometimes would come and want to own your research or own your work, own your deliverable. And yeah, let's say it the word is getting jealous about what you, your success in some way and very often you'll it's it's this fear basically of of being replaced by maybe they they get fearful that oh this person is is more knowledgeable will they replace me in the job so kind of of that thing i think it's both both as a student and as a staff so when i uh, created for example the women in academia network i faced loads of issues there so one i had to actually relocate myself from my uh, department which was systems of engineering i had to relocate to somewhere else because of all the comment all the discrimination from male peers but also there were um, women um, who were female staff who could not get their head around the idea that oh there you go that student who's just new to the uk and doing this thing that no one had the idea of doing so you will get this at a it, it's very subtle and you need to to read that you need to understand that because it chokes you at that some point in time and i'll give you another example for example in one particular place where i work um they they uh, introduced a reward, a staff reward system, which was about the values of the organization. And I got all of them, which was about passion, I think, integrity, excellence, and I think support it was. So my online manager had a really hard time to congratulate me. He didn't congratulate me, he didn't even say congrats. So it's that sense of insecurity. And uh, I've had tough appraisal meetings which i knew i was you know getting you know everything was was being ticked but then there, there were things that were being created right and in another institution that i work i didn't even have my probation <laughs> i didn't even go for my probation it was very interesting and fortunately slt at that time knew what, I, what my work was what i was working on and they were like they just bypassed my ex-line manager and his online manager and this just approve everything so you need to kind of know <laughs> procedures and stand up for yourself because when you're doing the right thing it's it it may so sound like alien to other people so they, they'll create it's just that fear it's natural right for people to fear to be afraid and it's just a natural fear that kind of they, they automatically just create challenges for you even if they are not even working on specifically the line of research that you are doing and at a more holistic level i would say like at an institutional level and societal level i'll give you an example for example the aurora program i'm pretty sure everyone on the call knows about the aurora program if you visit the advanced IG page there are universities that are identifying male staff maybe because i don't know they are the team lead for inclusion, they are the team lead for, they are the a, a provisi or whatever. So they are identifying male staff to be champions of uh, Aurora. So it's like having a white male for the champion of a race equality charter. Now, I'm not saying that men should not be ahead uh, woman empowerment activities, but let's face it, if you ask a man to please describe your experience about menopause, about period cramps, about birth process. Uh, they'll feel on that. So my my take on that is it's so ridiculous, to be honest, in 2024 to have 
uh, HEI's higher education institution is still not understanding how DEI should be done. And obviously this affects your research rate. And um, also a little bit saddened with the fact that the female staff and women in leadership at those particular institutions are still stuck with self-doubt, are still stuck with insecurity in those institutions. And no one is actually raising a voice. And I've just given you an example around Aurora, and that's existing right now. There's proof for it, okay? <laughs> it's, it's, it's a real story. So if you go even for race equality charter or anything, you go about, that's what you see, okay? And at no point in time I'm saying that we should not include male in the conversation. Of course we should, because the problem is the male. So when you look at, at anti-racism work as well, the problem is, okay, we need to actually get more white people to get involved in the conversation, right? But having them as the champion, I think this thing of, okay, who am I seeing up there? And that actually impacts research, impacts students, impacts everything at all level. It's it's very interesting. And if, like for me in my case, like when I do get collaborators from such institution, what often happens is you get people saying X, Y, Z, and it remains X, Y, Z because the people don't feel empowered enough because institutionally at the institution, that's the message they are seeing. So in case of Women Empowerment Project, it would be like they are seeing themselves as inadequate. They already have been subconsciously told they're inadequate, right? Because the institution has, has identified a male champion. So when you do around anti-racism, it's the same thing. All, all the work that you want to do, especially to around DI, it's, it's still like that. There will be challenges. There will be challenges in, in DI work, but I think my my take on it, how I've, I've, I've done it, I think the, <laughs> the over a decade of experience in the UK has kind of taught me a few things, which is build a skill set. I've, I've kind of been building my skill set and going for CPDs and just upskilling myself. And I don't sugarcoat stuff as well. So I'm willing at some extent to have a circle which is decreasing, but as long as the value of the circle is increasing, I don't know if that's clear to whoever is, is, is listening, is I'd rather have connections where I can hold a healthy debate on a research project and put the pros and the cons on the project as it is, black on white, right, on paper, rather than sugarcoat things. And, um, yeah, I think it's, it's a lot about who you travel with when you're doing research not just research, I mean, any DIY, it's who you, tr who you take that path with, who's with you. Okay. I hope I've answered. There are so many challenges left to me. That I, can <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, it's, it's, it's just, you know, all these are sometimes nowadays, like things that I laugh on because uh, it's so long ago and I was like, God, oh, did that. I mean, like, for example, I'll tell you, I, I said earlier, I started to do, disability work because I was not I would do the scholarship that I was supposed to do and at that time I was told something very specific which was don't ask for your full scholarship you're not supposed to question the white male and at that time yeah I didn't question the white male and I'll tell you something else even when I was a staff I've seen loads of people loads of staff threatening international students in um, stopping their scholarship if they don't you know like just to kind of yeah, that's how you need to act. I expect you to act like this. If you act anything differently, I'm going to stop you. This is still happening to date. So the challenges that I faced so many years back, and I think maybe the other, like Iwi and, and Emmanuel, might agree with that as well. The challenges are still the same, to be honest. It's just a bit under the carpet. It's different people doing that. It's different collaborators, obviously, but it's still pretty much the same. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. And I think it's a, it's still a, a sort of systemic issue. And, and that's something that we're looking, hopefully, to um, to address. So thank you very much, uh, Tirumani. That, that's been very rich. Um, Emanuela, can I come to you? Thank you, Tunde. I share many of the points and the views that Tirumani has just uh, discussed. Uh, I agree certainly with her. There are many challenges, and uh, many of many she has already identified. And one uh, that she has already discussed is that 
um, this is a working on anti-racism or equality inclusion is a never ending job is we are very far away from a just society or from just organizations and uh, it is continuously an unfinished job so just this is not a kind of work where you can have quick or short term rewards so already this is a is a big challenge but this is an important point that we should remember because uh, is it requires a level of um, internal determinancy uh, of skills, but also of personal skills in terms of resilience, resistance, uh, because it can be challenging every single day. And because it's unfinished, long, but it's also because it's a kind of journey that also implies some steps forwards and many steps backwards and then again you go forwards and again backwards so it's not a linear process and so this is one of the challenge another challenge that i face uh, on a personal level is that is often uh, there are some joys but it's also a kind of work where there is lots of grief and fear and Personally, you have to um, build some structure to be able to deal uh, with aspects. And uh, recently, we have seen in the UK, just a few days ago, we have seen what happened to our MP, uh, Diane Albert. And that shows, that event to me showed that sometimes we have really to return to the basics. And we are really on a... Um, when you think that some uh, some level of awareness of some levels of rights have been granted, then something happens that you realize that no, we are again at ground zero. At national level, this was you know certainly what happened to the MP last week is an event. What is happening on the international level in Palestine again is another context and scenario where remind us that basic rights are not yet granted to all human beings in the world. So this is very challenging uh, and very difficult emotionally. As being in this field as a white person also brings um, other distinctive challenges, uh, which are, for my personally, for me, are always due to the slippery and somehow ambiguous position that I perceive in myself being a white, for instance, a white scholar, a white researcher studying the colonization, and to what extent, as a white person, can I contribute to this, to this, this debate without colonizing them, without enacting oppressive dynamics towards certain scholarships, towards certain uh, scholars, towards certain colleagues. So there are important questions such as, do I have anything to add here? Will my contribution here in terms of words, writing, hacks, will might be oppressive for someone around me? These are always questions that um, I need to ask myself. It's not a comfortable, uh, it's always an uncomfortable work. And I think that this level of feeling uncomfortable, I find it very healthy and it helps me to continuously self-reflect on uh, my role, my possibility, and decide where it's better for me to be there, but maybe stay silent or do nothing. So this challenging, uh, this also is another specific challenge that I perceive with regards to the work, uh, EDI work, and my own specific positionality. Oh, excellent. Thank you very much, um, Emanuela. I mean, you, you're quite right. You know, again, it, it, it depends on your position. And as, as you said, you rightly said that this is not a linear process. You know, you, you take you know, one step forward, two steps backwards. And, but but I suppose it takes an emotional toll on yourself as well. Uh, but we'll get to that um, later on. So can I invite um, uh, Iwi now? So the question for those of uh, you that are just joining us, the question that we are that our panelist is helping us to um, understand is with regards to if there are any specific challenges that they faced um, when they are researching 
um, into um, DEI, either at an institutional or even at a personal level. Um, so Iwi, can I ask you to give us a response? Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's lovely to see you all. Thanks, Tunde, for the for the invitation, first of all. Um, yeah, obviously echo all of the comments that have been made before. Um, I think there is something about the emotional labour of this work that goes unrecognised and that we can find ourselves in very harmful spaces. Um, I think there's also something about the lens through which this work is looked at. So there's obviously policy work around EDI accreditations, things that I would argue might be quite performative that universities and companies go for. Um, and then there's an intention there that isn't about social justice, but is about, you know, reputation or, or looking good or whatever it might be that can add to the harm in these spaces. Um, that I believe are people who are involved in EDI work who perhaps see it as a way of career advancement because it's you know very in vogue <laughs> at the moment and I and I recognize that from conversations in the research that I have with different people that it seemed you know after George Floyd race was front and center of EDI work and now we move on to neurodivergence um, and other characteristics. And I think there's a, a lack of understanding around inter, um, intersectionality, um, again, which I, you know, I think can be quite harmful in this space. I think there are the obvious difficulties around funding. So there's pots of money around when it's kind of in vogue and people are running around thinking we've got this social justice issue. Um, that's affecting everybody, let's do something about it. But actually the rest of the time, it can be very difficult to access funding um, for, this, for this sort of work. Um, and I think that imposter syndrome is something certainly as an individual, I have struggled with um, in, in this work um, as well. And I think the lack of um, black women professors, as we know, there's there's been advancements now, thankfully, with you know initiatives like One One Hundred. But three years ago, to say we only had twenty eight black women professors out of over seventeen thousand at that time, you know, as as someone who was then coming into research, it was really difficult to access a mentor or to have someone who might sponsor sponsor me in my organisation for the sort of work that I I do. So I found that very difficult and I had a very 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 difficult experience as a PhD student which I don't think is a unique experience for racially minoritized people working in research that effectively meant I was self-taught and as I say have huge imposter syndrome when it comes to actually doing research so I think you know all of those things together mean that it can be a really difficult space to be in and this is why it's fantastic events like this happen because you find your tribe, <laughs> you find your people, um, you know, you gain strength from collective action and from having access to people who have similar experiences and, and can understand and can offer advice um, and support and um, point you to opportunities, which is something that, you know, I've kind of learned to look for perhaps a bit more effectively over the years. The other thing that I would say is, um, you know, often people will say to me, oh, you're such a nice person that's why you do you know this EDI work because you're good-hearted and yeah a lot of us are um, there are some people who aren't and actually that's not what EDI is about <laughs> it's not about being a nice person you know today spoke about the, the kind of systemic racism Emanuela um, and Germany also spoke about those things the kind of really harmful societal systemic um, barriers, biases, prejudices um, that can negatively impact on uh, particular groups of people. And it takes everybody. So the last thing that I would say is very tactical work and you need to learn how to become tactical. And that's a challenge. That's been a challenge for me in this work, something that I've had to develop. But also I very much welcome 
um, my white colleagues who come into this space because I feel an obligation to do this work because I see the injustices that impact on family, friends, you know, I see students who are coming through as my son and daughter, but actually white colleagues who actually come into the space and recognise their positionality and our co-conspirators choose to do that work. And it's not easy work, but I don't think we can be blind to the fact that there are also some people who come into this work for self-interest purposes. And it's about um, finding your tribe um, within all of that, but also taking care of yourself. Well-being is hugely important because it can be quite harmful, but it is joyous at the same time. Well, excellent. Thank you very much, um, um, Iwi, for, for, for that. I mean, it's very clear that, you know, there are challenges and and, um, and, and, and there are hurdles that we need to sort of um, overcome. And it's very clear that, yes, it's not a linear process. Um, you know, we're dealing with people's mindsets, you know, people that have, you know, been taught a particular way of thinking and asking them to think differently can then, you know, become a, a big challenge. Uh, Emanuela, of course, also touched around that sort of uh, positionality which we also mentioned so we're talking about you know allyship which is also something that we've been talking about um at um, lgmu um recently um so hopefully we will be able to sort of cover some of those um issues but if i were to sort of move on very quickly to the next question again i'm very mindful of time uh, we've only got uh, about 40 minutes um left um so if you can you know maybe strictly you know, um, condense your answers to maybe two minutes or three minutes. Um, that would be very, very helpful. I know there's a lot to say, uh, and I apologize for putting this limit on you. Okay, I, I, I shouldn't be doing that, so I, but I apologize um, for, for the sake of time. So the next question is around, um, you've done, I mean, we've talked about challenges now, and I know a lot of you are doing a lot of meaningful and impactful work. So if somebody, for example, was thinking of, you know, doing, uh, this work, or maybe they're currently working around um, DEI. How 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 have you um, gone about generating impact from your DEI research? So if I swap it around this time around, um, if I go to um, Emanuela first, then Iwi, and then and then Tirumani. Thank you, Tunde. I will try to be as brief as possible. Um, Thank you. I think that in terms of impact, it depends on what we mean by impact, in the sense that how impact is generally considered and uh, uh, captured by metric driven procedures, forms, etc. It is there very difficult for my research to have a short term quantitative impact. I see my research and my work as a part of a collective effort where I contribute to a bigger goal together with other colleagues, activists in academia outside that are working towards the same goal. So I have, and I'm very happy not to um, enjoy my micro impact and to be part of a more collective effort. In, in the short term, the way in which I try to achieve impact embed my principles in the way I do research. So if I'm working with other people, if I'm working with organizations, when I'm working with communities in the UK and elsewhere, the impact that I want to see is in, within the research project itself, making it sure that the, that the way we work reflects and embeds the principle I uphold in my DIY work, anti-racist and decolonial work. I hope I have been Yes, that's yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you very much. Being mindful of the impact within that sort of research context. Um, so that's that's very helpful. Thank you very much, Emanuela. So Iwi, if I come to you. Sure. Um, so what I would say, um, over time, I've realised the importance of evaluation um, and dissemination and telling the stories of the people for whom I work with and work for. So a lot of my research is um, with students, for students. Um, and I make sure now that I have evidence of difference, evidence of quality, evidence of experience. And I, and I capture that in all sorts of different ways that will speak to different audiences. Um, so I'm telling the story of the work that we're doing and sharing that. I also engage 
in a lot of action-based research, participative or participatory research. So I'm working with students and they're developing as researchers and they're bringing their own ideas and insights into the work that I'm, I'm doing with them. Um, I engage in a lot of scholarship, a lot of research activity. So even though, you know, on, on an education pathway in terms of my career trajectory, I make sure that I go out, I do the conferences, I'm in the community, I'm in schools, um, everywhere I can be really to kind of talk about the work that's happening and to try and involve as many different stakeholders as possible. And finally, what I would say is um, the students, the impact for the students is everything. So just as Emanuela was saying, I'm not bothered about four star publications <laughs> as much as other people might be. I am more bothered that the work that I'm doing is serving the underserved and the, and the students, the minoritized and marginalized students for whom you know, I'm trying to support and, and if I can tell the story along the way and share that with others and bring others collectively to mobilise that work even more, then that's that's an impact for me. Excellent. Thank you very much, Iwi. Um, Tirumani? Yeah, so a bit, a bit of everything that they have said. I think personally, I don't think impact is a one person thing. It's like you create a wave. You kind of go, so I go in depth, I create a wave, and it's the other people that I've impacted who kind of then create the wider impact. Because it's so intangible, I think, uh, Emmanuel, I was saying, you can't measure impact. I'll give you an example. There's one particular university, I won't mention its name. They did a very nice project around DEI for new students, and after two years, they stopped it because they were not seeing results. So they, people tend to think that DEI will give immediate results. It will give small immediate results, but not the one that you're measuring. And that's where a lot of people get it wrong. I'm not saying, well, a lot of people also tend to say change is slow, which in some way is true, but you need to have small steps. You need to have small goals. But if you just go for the big goals, you're not going to see that at all in DI. I mean, and, and anti-racism is, a, is a, you know, we are fighting and uh, a generational issue here for many generation, right? And um, one thing, I don't know if it was, I think it was Iwi who was talking about reflection. So that's one thing that I do a lot, which is writing notes, reflect and improve. And I think the impact really probably started when I started to blog about it. I mean, I don't sugarcoat. <laughs> and um, I think the, the, the good thing as well with me is because I'm a consultant, so I'm not associated with an institution. So I will say it as it is. I will not be, I don't have to be scared with any one line manager or HR <laughs> kind of, you know, seeing what I'm, what I'm saying. I'm just saying it as it is. So not sugarcoating has really helped me in creating impact. But one of the things that I have seen creates, creates more impact is actually when I started to take the creative route. But two years ago, I started to write poems. I, I, I participated in the first open mic and it has had loads of impact. It's been referenced by people. It went, somebody took it and put it in a magazine. So I was like, what, seriously? And that's how I realized that people were not necessarily, you know, because different people gather different things, have different energy. So it's trying different ways as well. But I can't exactly pinpoint on impact as such because impact, it can be, I still get people who are reading something I've written two, three years back. And I'm like, okay, I forgot that I wrote about that. So impact, I think it's is something that once you, once you do something around DEI because you're trying to change the social fabric, right? So this will have long lasting impact in the long run as well. So you can't exactly put a, you know, put a measure to that. I think that's a bit of a mistake that sometimes we well like yeah there are some certain things that yeah we need to be tangible on but sorry have I been two minutes more so. <laughs> no 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 you were you were you were yeah you were on time and on point thank you very much for that uh, Tirumani um thank you very much to our panelists because I know you've got plenty to say on, on on that um topic um so if we move quickly then to the fourth question so we've been talking we've talked about challenges um We've talked about, you know, um, generating impact and what that could look like. Um, now, I'm sort of going at the sort of personal level now. Um, and um, 
to warn everybody else, I'm not putting anybody here on the spot. You know, I've sent this question beforehand to them, so um, so they 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 know hopefully um, what sort of um, response to give to this. So the question is: of all your research activities um, or project or or even publications, um, which one is the most fulfilling for you, and we want to know why. Um, because you know you have to be passionate about this work, you know, to 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 do it. You know, has there been any instance, you know, in your journey where you, you were like, oh yes, I'm glad, you know, I'm glad I did that, or I'm glad, you know, we achieved that, and you know, so just can you share with us one moment like that in your DEI research journey. Again, it doesn't have to be a popular um, response. It could be something I would put in quote selfish you know um for yourself so please do do share with us so um if we shall i shall we go to you first and then sure thank you okay so mine um is a project called aspire that i um led um just over two years ago it started um i'm really proud of it for lots of different reasons i'm going to try not to take up too much space but i have lots to say about the project so the first thing is um, it was funded by a research grant from UKI and Research England. So it's the biggest grant I've ever got by a long way. Um, £340,000, completely unexpected. Um, and for me, it was complete validation of a lot of the work that I'd done to that day, to that point, and confirmed that I can do research, even though lots of people had told me and during my PhD that I could not. So, so that's one thing. I'm, not just proud of the fact that you know i sat within the one percent of the black researchers who managed to get that sort of funding from funding council but actually it was what the money enabled me to do which was to design this program for black black heritage people um and it was to address some of the pipeline issues of black black heritage people getting into doctoral study um or graduate employment and in the very first cohort, we supported 34 people, um, some of whom were at university, some of whom weren't. So we reached out to the community. Fantastic outcomes. I met one of our um, graduates um, from the first cohort just yesterday. She's 62. She started a PhD. She did a master's after she'd finished the programme and decided she wanted to do a PhD. We have people for whom they did not think a PhD or doctoral study was an option for them who realised actually there had just been this imposter syndrome, this crisis of confidence, they didn't think it was for them. And we demystified what a PhD is about, we built their confidence, we opened up access to opportunity, and they've soared. And so impact, absolutely, we've achieved it with this programme. The only thing that I would say is I left the programme for, for lots of reasons I'm not going to go into, but it was harmful. And as a black woman leading that project, it was hugely, hugely difficult. And there was misogynoir, there was harm, there was appropriation of work. And again, this is, you know, a risk um, that can happen in this work. So whilst it was the most amazing thing that I have ever done and has led to other work that I'm now doing, which is equally brilliant, it taught me a lot about the harm in this space. Um, so I'm really thankful for the opportunity to have done it. And as I say, it has transformed lives, which is what I try to do. Sorry, Tunde, I took lots of time. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's all right. No, 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 it's really interesting, you know, to hear that, you know, sometimes it's not just doom and gloom, you know, there are you know, bits that you enjoy, you know, those, uh, aha, this is why I do this, you know, uh, the sort of impact that you're making. And I'm sorry to hear that, you know, uh, you know, you know what will be will always be you know in 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 the sort of work that we do so thank you very much for that um Emanuela. Uh, thank you i will mention two very briefly very quickly um, one very fulfilling uh, um recent experience that um i had was to apply for a, a phd scholarship you know about this tunda and uh, in applying for this, I met via email lots of, uh, we know that it's very difficult for international students to have a full PhD scholarship. So when there was this opportunity, I contacted several colleagues that I have in Uganda. So by the way, after a process, I um, met 
a fantastic colleague that she, she's working already as a lecturer in a university, but she doesn't have the PhD. And at the end, we presented the project and uh, we were successful. And now she has a full scholarship for a PhD here. And um, I was very, very, very happy about this result. It was not expected, it was very difficult, but uh, yeah, it, um, really, it was really fulfilling, although a process. And the, another one is a, a paper that I wrote about whiteness and decolonization, on which I hired work for like three, four years. It has been a very long journey. But I'm very glad because it helped me to write down and address some key questions that I had in my mind for a very long time. And I, I needed personally to find a way to write them down. And I hope it will help also other colleagues, also including white colleagues, to engage with racism and decolonization in higher education. Oh, excellent. Thank you very much for that. And I share, I share in your joy. Thank you, Manuela. Uh, <laughs> uh, Tirumani. I'll aim to be quick. So it's one thing, if, if I have to keep to technology, it's my work around access and learning technology and my under, understanding of our own internationalization and how this fits into using technology. There is a tendency, I think, um, like in the West that, yeah, we going, you know, people like fancy technologies and get swayed easily by anything new. For example, right now it's AI and chat GBD, right? And then, however, the problem is then imposing this onto other regions. So if we take just the recent hype with chat GPT, I think we were saying where the funds are, right? <laughs> so, for example, US, there's a, there's a very good reason why US is a superpower, you know, and it will remain the topmost uh, for quite some time, for a few decades. It's, it's almost like a universal empire that kind of used as a master in a slavery system in some way because you've got uh, most of the world which is under the u.s uh, hegemony mainly because it has developed this strategy and it comes you know this includes all technology whether it's uh, military or whether it's anything right science and obviously learning it uh, learning technology and i don't want to go too much in details because it will involve lots of geopolitics and everything and it will go on <laughs> forever a few good hours but there's something else that as my role as chair in learning um of the ALT SIG is to be honest I spent a good chunk of my time earlier firefighting <laughs> sadly rather than creating impact and things like this and we I think was talk talking about something tactical is is you've got to kind of sometimes be tactical on doing it's not just always about being very nice and things like this so there are projects that I I get involved, which, yes, it's it's to change things. It's to really change things on the ground. And moving away from learning technology is my work around internationalization. So I do loads of um, mentoring around like several universities elsewhere, well, so students and stuff as well. So that's my little baby, <laughs> close to heart, the closest to heart. <laughs> Oh, excellent. Thank you very much, Romani. I mean, yeah, fantastic work, amazing work. And, uh, and, and, and uh, yeah, separately, you know, I'm, I'm really proud of all the work that you've, you've, you've done. And you, you, because I see all your work on LinkedIn. So yeah, I'm always very, very happy to, to, to see that. If I was, to, if I was to then come by, because I'm, again, mindful of time, we've got 20 minutes left. And I know that there are members within the audience who would like to ask questions or, or add comments. And um, so if I condense the next two questions into one, um, and that is around talking about anti-racism, research around anti-racism. Now, so far we've been talking about DEI, but right now we want to concentrate on, um, on anti-racism, okay? So thinking specifically uh, of anti-racism, from your experience, what are the challenges that one would face when researching into um, anti-racism, especially when we are looking at anti-racism within the learning technology um, space. So challenges, uh, one, and then what then would be your advice, okay, to somebody who was wanting to start their journey into researching around anti-racism 
or, or even maybe D, DEI. Okay, so what sort of advice would you give to them thinking about some of the challenges involved in, in this space? Uh, Tirumani, can I come to you first? Okay, so I'll take this um, the technology part first. So I think there's a there's a disconnect between we are using learning technology, but there's a whole science and the whole thing behind how do you develop technology and there's a complete disconnect between these two people so i happen to be a software engineer so i kind of understand that and i also happen to be working a lot with people sitting in africa and asia as well so i was a remotion right so i'll give you a very um, simple example right now we're using blackboard collaborate and every time we use blackboard Collaborate, we have to invite our speakers beforehand and give them the little surprise and by the way you cannot uh, filter your background you cannot apply any effect so this in itself like there is this assumption that for example everyone is um, owning their own house for example or have a nice office well decorated with few you know books behind to show that we were right or something like that and that in you know when you talk of anti-racism a lot of people who come from marginalized vulnerable you know and when also when we're talking of uh, people uh, of color certain ethnicities they do feel fearful they do feel humiliated to even show their background sometimes we've had this whole digital poverty i think i shared a link uh, that you can share in the chat about um digital poverty there's so much around that but why are we taking time why are we taking time to change these things and one other thing that I'll tell you, so the first VLE that got developed in the UK was uh, Wolf, it was called Wolf in 1991. So when I was actually, I was I, I was <laughs> working at Wolverhampton and we had both Canvas and Wolf basically running in parallel. So Wolf uh, was being used for program validation and, and all the bits and pieces, the processes. And then on another end, you had uh, all the teaching being done in Canvas. But again, back to what I said earlier is US is, is a superpower for a reason because we kind of just outsource everything. Why are British university, universities still outsourcing all of this development, all of these things? And we cannot find a solution for us locally here if we're relying on software that's being developed elsewhere. And that coming back to ChatGPT, what I said earlier, with what I said about geopolitics, it's all about that as well. Because we are relying for a solution that's not for us, and we are thinking we'll get a solution. And what happens is we end up creating a bigger problem. And I am I think I'm lucky in the sense that I tend to always stand back and look at ahead, what's the bigger problem? So one thing around that, and we we'll, next question was, what was your question? Oh, it was about um, uh, sorry, challenges, right? Uh, no, sorry, somebody who would start a journey. Uh, I would say don't listen to everybody else. <laughs> I think DEI journey is something people come into DEI journey with. First of all, they are people, right? They come for various reasons. Either they leave. Uh, experience or experience of their loved ones or something they've witnessed that they really want to change about it okay and they will have biases because of that okay for example uh, but i've also come across for example people who work around certain disability projects but they've never directly worked with any students or staff with disability so you also have this happening and then obviously researchers we are people we have our own uh, biases and framing so, for example, it's like, I'll give you an example. So last year we had the, a, a black TikToker who was just going in houses randomly, walking into people's houses, right? You probably have heard of that. And a lot of people on my LinkedIn as well, which I follow as in a professional capacity, a lot of activists, a lot of researchers as well just went racism, but it was not a case of racism, right? So I think we have to look at as influencers as researchers as activists and all we have to look at what we're doing as well we do have a certain responsibility and there's always this thing that happens and i think it was emanuela who mentioned about um dana but uh, a bit earlier last week what happened right so that's happening now today and that's in the parliament and it's exactly a copy of what we see in society as well so my thing is is get into it and a lot of the thing that i learned was trial and error fall down get up 
and become more resilient and learn. There's so many examples that I can I can give you. I think last year when I did a, it's on recording, when I did the ALT, uh, ALTC conference, I presented on behalf of ALT SIG and I shared another example about a DI lawyer, but he ended up doing on social media. So we need to be careful. And literature itself is, um, I think I'm blessed in some way that I'm a polyglot, so I can source out information in, in various places. And I can have a, I wouldn't say full fledged, I don't read or write all languages, but I still have a better understanding. I can, I can get a better understanding. So, yeah, I think it's, it's not really specific advice, but it's from my experience, what I've, what I've learned. So did I keep it simple? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. That's really useful to know. And I think it's very helpful to, to, to know as well. And um, so if I come to Iwi. Um, to answer the, the first bit of the question today, I think, which was um, about technology, wasn't it, and some of the issues associated with, with tech and, and this anti-racism work. Um, first thing is people don't like talking about race. They find it quite uncomfortable and people don't like to sit in their discomfort. So that's always, you know, there's always the whataboutism conversation to get over. I think specifically with learning technology, Part of the problem is people take the learning context, but they don't recognize the context. So there is an assumption that the learning context is colorblind. Um, and so people have um, a hard time understanding equity and the idea that we are increasing the size of the pie and not taking bits of the pie away from people. Um, I think there's a, a difficulty in understanding what equity is and that you have to meet people where they are, but that doesn't mean that people lose out. So I think there's that. I think specifically then in terms of the tech bit, what you then find is that people talk about technology as a thing that is separate from the context. So some of the um, comments that were made before about accessibility, um, for example, are not factored into the research or the um, funding requirements um, around tech research that I think, you know, is really, really important. So we see this when people have these conversations about AI being the great leveller and, and not understanding that actually AI in the same way that a lot of tools are can open up access opportunity, but it can also be a big barrier to people. And the fact that AI doesn't have um, ethics. In, in my view, there's no sort of statutory body around ethics or legislation that kind of protects users from some of those harms. You know, the fact that it uses data scraping, machine learning, all the kind of biases that are bedded into the data that we have available on the internet and all the information sources now are just baked into what AI does. And there isn't a recognition of that then when people are doing the research or asking for the funding around those specific contextual factors. So we know, we know from the research incarceration rates, you know, if you look at graduate recruitment, you know which groups are going to be disproportionately impacted by the use of AI or other technology. And for me, it's because people separate the context don't understand equity, or there's a willfulness not to, <laughs> to recognize that. And actually, all it does is perpetuate the harms that we have in society for the same groups that we have anyway. And I think that's hugely problematic, obviously. The advice that I would give to people, I sound really negative all the time. I don't mean to be. <laughs> I came into this work, work saying, I'm going to change the world. It's going to be brilliant. And then, you know, you realise you're sat in rooms with fantastic people who've been doing this work for 30 years and will convince you that actually the marginal gains are still gains. The collective effort that we have moves things forward. And it is not a linear iterative process. It will be two steps forward, five steps back, you know. But if we just acknowledge that by doing something and having some impact collectively, that moves things forward, then that should motivate people. But always be mindful that you have to protect yourself, you know, in this. But there are others who are doing the work, who you can seek out, who can help, who can help move things forward. So I, my one bit of advice would be, Find a network, find your tribe, and try and find a mentor. 
Oh, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, very, very well put. Thank you very much, Yui. Um, if I ask um, Emanuela to sort of come in, um, particularly if you can sort of maybe touch on around, you know, um, the issue of allyship, you know, somebody who's sort of starting in this journey who, for example, maybe is a white colleague and who wants to, you know, start working within this space, what would be your advice for, for them? Uh, thank you, Tunda. My main, my first advice, you know, would be that I would invite them to look at racism and whiteness as social dynamics, structural processes to move from individual focus of the racist person or the active to to move from an individual focus on the individual to a focus on that processual, social, rooted dynamics and structure that we have in our society. Because if we see whiteness as an ingrained structure of our societies, there is, it is not possible to be outside it. You are part of a system that awards privilege and oppression according to the skin colors and other axes of identity. So if you do your homework and learn how these work at the societal level and within institutions, within your own organizations, it is virtually impossible not to think that you have a role to play because either you choose it or not, you are already part of these dynamics. And the more you um, close your uh, the more you come closer to issues of oppressions, inequality, racism, the more opportunities you have to uh, do a part, do your part on the right side of the history. And in order for you to do this, my second piece of advice would be to engage personally in relations in, uh, in many different ways, reading, engaging in relationship with those that have a lived experience that is different from yours, because it's through building relationship with different people that have a lived experience different from your own, that you can understand how best you can support them in a, um, creating more equal workplaces and societies for them and for all, all, all of us. Excellent, thank you very much, um, Emanuela. Because uh, what, and white allyship is also an area that is, you know, at the moment, a lot of um, institutions are not getting right. So it's very important to start to have that sort of conversation um, and to, to, to really get the ball roll, rolling in, in this area. To um, cap it all up, if I was to ask you, all right, in just one sentence, if you can manage it, okay, um, I know it's not easy, but in just one sentence, um, what does your own version of an ideal anti-racist institution look like? What should that institution look like for you to say, that, okay, that is an anti-racist um, institution? Tirumani first. I can give you a one line, yeah. So it's basically just an, um, a business equation, which is coming right from the higher education sector plus capital, obviously access to capital, plus consistency from regulators and commitment from people. People is everyone. And that's when you get to see something, but I'll add something else. You will not get to see that in the UK though. I had a little short story to share, but it will take more than, it will take, Two minutes, so <laughs> I'll skip that. Well, we can come back. We can come back to that after you know if we've got yeah. enough time, because we'll, we'd love to hear yeah. that. Um, Emanuela. Very briefly, for me, an anti-racist organization is an organization that is able to look at racism within the organization, and they are able to look at it, to name it, and to put in place system and mechanism to contrast it, which is very different from writing policies and strategies toward the future or using terms such diversity, inclusion, 
I'm talking about an organization that is committed to, because racism exists in all organizations. It would be impossible to find a single organization that is entirely, um, that doesn't have any level of racism. There is, and there is a lot of it in higher education, for instance, and we know because that, that data tell us this. So an anti-racist organization is an organization that starts its journey towards inclusion, looking at why, in which occasions, in which practices are we racist, and how can we stop this? Excellent. Thank you very much for that, Emanuela. Um, Iwi. Felt like I was in an exam today. You know, when you have to write down an answer, and have to get it right. So I've written because everyone knows I can talk. So I have written something down very quickly. So for me, intentionally, explicitly, authentically, and consistently addressing racial bias whilst reflecting and actively implementing systemic changes to address it. Wow. Okay. Very, very impressively done. Thank you very much. That's really <laughs> succinct and, and you've bottomed lined it very well. Thank you uh, for that. So, um, so thank you very much um, our, um, to the to our panelists. I think there's a couple of questions um, uh, in the chat space. I'll just read them out um, and uh, perhaps maybe one person should, you know, attempt it. If anybody else has anything additional to, 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 to input, then please feel free to do to do that. We've only got four minutes left, so please again be mindful of the uh, of your answers. So the first question is from Rob. Um, so what is the impact of a non-representative staff group on the student population? Um, are there any ways um, to become more representative and open? I'll take that. Okay. <laughs> Uh, there are ways of becoming more representative, but then when we become when we do representation, let's remember there's a quota system that is not working in the UK and is not working in any other countries as well. So who are we asking to represent uh, us? And if I may share my one minute and a half story now, do I have time? So quick, quick story. Th uh, about six months ago, there's a student who actually published a book, uh, Sound, Rashmi Sound. So, it, she was the first Hindu student representative at the Oxford University uh, student uh, committee, whatever they call it, Ox, uh, right? So she was the president and there was a staff, a true story, go to the news and you'll be able to Google and get all out that. So there's a staff who picked on her, who went on a witch hunt, uh, attack her, you know, previous posts that she's written that her mother, her parents, her ex university, her past university and everything it was just like, <clears throat> excuse me for that it was just like creating stories about it and uh she published a book things that she couldn't say on the british soil she put that in her book and you can go google it read it and it will tell you loads of stories that have not been said in the media that have not been said in the open and even the media label what what ended up happening was what the media label as the dons of Oxford were a group of academics asking the university to change the social media policy because the person who basically attacked the student on social media is now was now being attacked by people and was feeling threatened. And uh, at last time that I checked, the person is still in uh, his uh, role. OK, and that same person actually had been and I'll tell you the comment exactly what it is, because I think it needs to be as in detail so that people know what's happening. Really, we just don't talk of representation, but there are things happening. So if you've got the wrong person, it can be the right place, but the wrong person. So the person actually even commented on an actress comment, which was about men who was flashing their genitals to them. And uh, his response on social media was, what did you do with their genitals when they showed it to you, according to you? That's a staff in our institution, uh, in, in, in a higher education sector in the UK, who's saying that in, in public, right? And you can imagine what power they have on students. And that person is still in place. So we have institutions mm -hmm. that are apparently creating changes in the UK, but they are not willing to change. And they are protecting those uh, perpetrators so representation can be done but it's got to be done carefully and i specifically wanted to 
tell you that example because it's very it's very profound and I can myself share loads of examples from my own experience, from the experience of students coming crying to me. It's happening. It's happening now, every day. So I understand. Oh, give that some thank, <laughs> thank, thank you so much for sharing that term to Romani. Um, I, I, I suppose, you know, there's so many things happening in, in our society, which, of course, you know, hopefully we can start to address a bit by bit. Again, let me first thank our panelists for um, giving us their time today and sharing their experience and their expertise around this um, topic. It's a difficult one, so, so we really appreciate you sharing your experiences. So thank you very much. Um, to Romani, thank you very much, Emanuela, and thank you, um, Iwi. For those in the audience, unfortunately, we've sort of run out of time. Um, if you've maybe put some questions in the chat, I apologize. Uh, we can take those chats um, offline and then we can hopefully address some of your questions. So thank you very much for your participation. Um, if you want to get involved um, with this, um, our SIG, um, that's the mailing list there uh, for you to see. Uh, so please do subscribe and we will hopefully um, be happy to have you as part of our community. Um, and if you're interested in any of these sort of resources and, and materials that we've got uh, within the um, special interest group, um, again, those are links that will be very useful um, for you to, to have. So thank you very much, everyone, uh, for coming. We hope you've really enjoyed it. I've thoroughly enjoyed it and hopefully see you um, next time we have a, a similar event. So thank you very much for coming. Rashmi? And um, I'll add something quickly. I'll add something quickly. So we have had more questions in the chat and I'll address it and add some, some more information in, in the blog and we can get some other response from the uh, other panelists as well. Is that okay? Excellent. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. Thank you everyone for coming. See you next time. Uh, yes, it's top, if you stop recording now. Thank you. Thanks all. I... Thanks, Emanuela, and thank, thanks, uh, <laughs> Yui. Thank you so much, Emanuela. Thank you. We'll be in touch. Let me see if I can stop recording. Sure. Thank you very much, Yui. Thank oh, you. Oh, no, I was just going to say apologies. I'm so sorry I was late to the yeah. session. Just... <laughs> Um, yeah. No, no, no. no I'm no, sure the technical ineptitude was on my <laughs> side, but at least managed to get here. So thanks, Tunde. Thanks for the invitation. No. Oh, thanks for coming, Louis. Really All appreciate right. you. Take Thank care. you. Bye. Thank yeah. you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. I'm just, I'm just trying to save the chat now. Let's see. I'm trying to stop the recording and I can't oh, seem to it's figure it stopped. out. It's stopped already. It's stopped. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. Maybe that's why I couldn't find it. Yeah, because it's not showing. Oh, wait. Uh, oh, no, it's still in progress. Bear with me. No, no.